Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start the last panel. Um, it's been a long day, uh, and it's getting late, but uh, we hope to have a very exciting and interesting discussion. Um, on uh, a topic which uh, is slightly different but yet connects to all the topics that we have been covering already today. Um, we've been talking more about the hard aspects and consequences of the uh, war in Donbass and uh, the annexation of Crimea. Um, and now we're going to talk about the sociological consequences of, uh, of the war. Um, in order to save time, I'm not going to introduce all the panelists. You're, you can uh, see their amazing bios in the program. Um, but I do want to briefly just introduce what we're going to talk about. Um, because when we talk about sociological consequences, we're looking more at how the society has been affected by war uh, in Ukraine. Um, looking at uh, the trauma, uh, a major issue which has been talked about a lot and I'm sure we will touch on is the IDPs or internal, internally displaced people which have been displaced throughout the whole country. So the whole uh, country of Ukraine has somewhat been affected or has been touched by the war. So the so so social consequences, sociological consequences, psychological consequences, emotional consequences of the war in Ukraine is our main topic uh, for today. Um, my name is Adam Reichert. I've already been introduced earlier today, so hopefully I don't need to introduce myself. Pa everybody knows who Pavel is. Um, and to begin uh, the discussion, we're going to have two opening remarks uh, by Bogumiła Berdachowska and Jarosław Hrycak. Um, tried to keep them between 10, 12 minutes each. And then we're going to open it up to a discussion, and we're going to try to make sure that we keep it as lively uh, and dynamic as it has been so far today. Um, hopefully everybody had a, a little glass of wine to help them loosen up uh, and uh, enjoy and, and engage in <laughs> maybe we could order some more for the for the for the panelists <laughs> yes, well. anyway okay so uh, why don't we begin right away um, with our opening remarks Pani Good evening. At such a late uh, hour, I will try to be brief. If my brief is too long, uh, please uh, intervene. So, we had revolution followed by annexation of the Crimea, and then uh, the outbreak of the war in the east of Ukraine facing it with challenges incomparable with earlier challenges in the brief history of Ukraine as a sovereign state. But we've heard also about uh, consequences consisting of the emergence of about one and a half million strong internally displa displaced uh, people, IDPs in political jargon. So uh, these are people running away from separatists and uh, Russian aggression, but time passes and problems linked to internal displacement are not resolved. Uh, with uh, such huge numbers at stake, every any state would have difficulty to handle the issue. But as uh, the war became um, a fact of daily life and the most dramatic moments have passed, 
when crowds of people uh, of refugees, internal refugees, uh, kind of invaded uh, Kiev and other major cities, uh, their fate uh, became less uh, interesting for the po politicians. And uh, uh, we've heard uh, in Zeshov that uh, unless there is pressure, the government wouldn't act. So the internally displaced uh, were appealed to, to keep uh, putting pressure on the government because without that the government would be passive. And uh, the huge wave of also migration out of Ukraine abroad seeking basic living conditions. There are different estimates of its size. Uh, recently it's been quoted that it may concern five million people who have left Ukraine and it's not uh, so fantastic because just in Poland last year 948,000 people worked in Poland uh, on temporary uh, contracts and 114 on uh, work contracts. So Poland is the first country um, to which um, uh, economic migration from Ukraine turns. So just according to statistical offices, 59% of uh, Ukrainian emigration goes to Poland, followed by Italy, 20%. According to the same source, then the Czech Republic, 5%, all other countries, uh, that's much smaller numbers. So it's a huge wave of migration, even if it's not uh, 5 million, uh, but only 4, it is still huge. And uh, let us stress, these people... Uh, are not looking for better living conditions, but for a way to survive for themselves and their families. So, frankly speaking, I haven't uh, encountered any traces of any active policy of Ukraine uh, on this issue, how to support this group. And what is even more amazing to me is the reaction of some distinguished intellectuals or journalists who describe this group as traitors of uh, Ukrainians' interests as a state. So first, the situation in Ukraine leads to conditions uh, uh, undermining uh, elementary survival, and then people are blamed for seeking survival by uh, going to work to other countries. And the most painful uh, effect, immediate effect of the events after the Maidan that's the dramatic impoverishment of uh, Ukrainian population. It's uh, twice or three times uh, smaller disposable income than before. This is really and truly dramatic. Uh, in the previous panel, the, or one of the previous panels, the word disillusionment was quoted, and I would elaborate on that. Frustration, disillusionment, resulting from the following factors. First, the feeling of the lack of elementary justice. No one has been uh, made accountable for uh, the Maidan, for the mm, treason, and so on, and neither politically nor 
legally. This has become the subject of jokes even. Uh, the mayor of Slovensk uh, was for a long time a lady was the only person accused uh, in this conflict. Uh, four years after there are no uh, no trials and no verdicts uh, on this account. And this reflects uh, the situation giving uh, way to Russian propaganda, uh, according to which uh, Maidan was destroyed uh, by its own activists. Also, uh, the causes behind Maidan have not been removed, uh, the, the negative factors which uh, gave rise to it. Corruption hasn't been re reduced and uh, it is a structural issue in uh, Ukraine. And small occasional successes uh, in the fight for uh, transparency of public life have been undermined. For example, uh, the, um, the declarations uh, of assets by the politicians, which were introduced uh, by uh, the protagonists of Changed. It turned out that the Ukrainian deputies uh, have at home uh, under the pillow uh, millions of dollars. Uh, incredible things. But the fact that uh, poli uh, Ukrainian politicians were forced to show that was a huge success of uh, civil society. But the system uh, reacted promptly when uh, demands were made uh, also for uh, civil society activists uh, to disclose their assets and also the quality of uh, the political class. Of course there are excellent exceptions, uh, we know them, but generally speaking uh, the um, the political class hasn't drawn any lessons from experience. The way it reacted to Maidan is still the same way it behaves today. Its arrogance uh, with respect uh, to the population, to society, is huge. And uh, those politicians who joined uh, uh, politics after Maidan were uh, very quickly uh, integrated with the uh, old guard and uh, adopted its uh, way of behavior. Uh, so access to politicians is very slight um, for the citizens and currently it's a very important period uh, for Ukraine because it can clearly be seen that there is a reconsolidation of the oligarchic system and the question whether this uh, society uh, mistreated by the war which has uh, given more than it had in the struggle for its own state and democracy whether this the question is whether this society will have uh, enough uh, strengths and resources to prevent this uh, reconsolidation wants to make that i think we will continue to draw out i will now hand the floor over to um to <coughs> Na rosyjskim kanale. 
I will have to leave you at nine. To m in many issues, I agree with what Boguslava has said, but uh, there are uh, points in which I disagree, and I will focus on those. Mass uh, immigration did not seriously influence the Ukrainian society. Maidan was uh, provoked. Today we uh, go back to the indicators from 2012 in the area of econo economy. Let me give you an example. We uh, calculated that with a few economists and sociologists, and those are the statistics. It, there is no dramatic impoverishment of the Ukrainian society, and that is a very serious uh, point to put forward. Uh, we um, drew our data from various places, also foreign sources, and the biggest impoverishment took place in 2015. Currently, the Ukrainians are uh, regaining the level of 2010-12. Migration is not a mechanism that is related to the impoverishment of, this, of the society. It's worth taking into account. My thesis is the following, that the Maidan was a serious explosion, but it is now being extinguished and uh, we don't know what is to come, what is to follow. I shall not uh, We need other microphones to be switched off on the table because there is interference with the sound system, please. This norm is the following, that 79% of the Ukrainian society support independence. There was a there was great support f during the Tuzla. I could shift to English, please. So there is there is basically no dramatic change when talking about Ukrainian society nowadays. If there is a if there is a support for Ukraine, it's basically stay with the niche. And this is between 17 and 90 percent of support. The niche, the kind of the support, increase every time when there is a, a external danger. And this has been Tuzla, the first peak, the second peak, Georgian, Georgian Russian war, and then the largest peak was Crimean annexion, which was tantamount to the results of the referendum in 1991. But still, this is within the niche. Because if you have a, have a, if you have a, a referendum of 1991 here in Ukraine again, Whatever you will take, whatever month, result will be the same. The result may be different, but in within, within, within the niche. So what I'm saying, there's some kind of misleading way of thinking that we, that we tend, to, tend, to, tend to pretend that there's some dramatic change. Having said that, I do not deny there's no change. But this basically not where are we looking for the change, because there's some things that we have to want to talk is not that, that evident. And in my, uh, in my take, the most dramatic change occurred sometimes by the end of the first zero decade. And this would be 2006 to 2008. And this is basically shift, dramatic shift, but not observed from the, uh, in, let's put it this way, 2008, the first time in Ukrainian history, GDP, the largest part of GDP, was produced not in industrial sector, but in service sector. And it's tremendous change. It has been noticed. <coughs> Because once you have this type of change, you could, you could expect the change of the structure of society, basically emergence of new middle class. And this basically, this is very young, young people, very educated, basically uh, living in the large city. So basically it's a fact of the large city. And their behavior is very much different because what is the most important for them is the high, high expectation. Probably even, say, more than high. 
the expectations are, and this, I believe, explains to a lot, to a large extent, the uh, a phenomenon of the Second Maidan. It was provoked or burned or whatever by this high expectation, which is all the characteristic for this new type of class, and this is, which was in, in turn related to this kind of shift to service, service, uh, service uh, uh, society. So basically, when they are leaving the country, it's not because they are poor, because their expectations are high. And this is quite, quite, different, quite different mechanism. They're not starving. Basically, what they, the IT young people, the high educated, they're looking for better perspectives. If you put in the language of the academic, academic language, it's those people who have a values of self-expression, so to say. And I believe, to a large extent, they provided uh, the bone, the core of the Avramaidan, then the volunteer movement, all the kind of things which we praise so, we praise, praise, uh, 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 so much. So uh, 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 we did some uh, surveys in 2015, and I believe there's two surveys which tells, provide you probably some kind of the difference, what is there. So basically, we did a national survey, and we did uh, six cities. So uh, when talking about this uh, group of the people, which I say we call it agent of changes, they make around 15%, or say they made in 1915, because I believe they decreased nowadays because of the immigration, uh, because of the uh, deprivation of the situation, so to say. So that's inevitable, but still they are there. We don't know how much of them, but still this is, this is a large, this is a very large, a large, a large segment, so to say. Uh, secondly, uh, we did uh, six cities, and uh, this was, do you have still time? Please. So uh, we have uh, Lviv, Kyiv, Dnipro, Kharkiv, Odessa, and Donetsk. As you may expect, Lviv and Donetsk make two opposite poles within in Ukraine. The most, there, but there were several, which, which is expected, but there are several kind of things which were very surprised. Some of them were nice surprises, but there was not, not quite nice surprise. The surprise is that we have a tendency, which already been before, but nowadays it's very evident. Kyiv is becoming more and more like Lviv. There is a tendency to rapprochement, so to say. Even so, uh, Kyiv speak uh, Russian, mostly Russian, the Ukrainian language, not like Lviv, but in terms of the uh, orientation, values, attitudes to Russia, Kyiv is becoming very close to Lviv. Uh, this, you have this axis, Kyiv, Lviv. Uh, the, nice, the other nice uh, surprise or change was that Dnipro is moving closely, this closer this direction. So then you have an extension with access. You have Lviv, Kyiv, and Dnipro. In sense. Say? In, sense? in sense of the uh, external orientation, Europe, uh, stand, uh, distance, to, to distance, distance to Russia, and uh, the, the, the readiness to for changes, all the kind of things. So do you have this kind of the dynamics? Dnipro is not still there, but it's moving this direction. So there is a chance or tendency, whatever, for the making this kind of new axis, which is Lviv, Kyiv, and Dnipro. The most intriguing part is where Odessa and Kharkiv, because we presume that Kharkiv, Odessa will be closer to Dnipro and Kharkiv closer to Donetsk. It's going to be vice versa. The Kharkiv is so-called safer zone, while Odessa is still kind of the, I would say, dangerous situation, so to say. I would still believe that Odessa is, is and still was and still is a very much critical city. If you want to have changes in Ukraine, you have to work with Odessa. But basically, you could treat it differently, but what I'm saying here, <coughs> my final point, we tend to criticize power. <coughs> and this is quite legitimate critics, without a doubt. The power deserves the critics' criticism. But I would say it's, it's always nice and sweet to criticize the power. I believe that uh, the, the, our, uh, the address of our criticism is was supposed to be civil society as well. What we are observing now, for the last two years, I believe, this is disintegration of civil society. Uh, uh, not because, so not of that, the disintegration of society. Uh, internal quarrels, growing antagonism, and variety types of society, right, civil society. First of all, we have this kind of society which has been very much granted, living on the grounds. Western grants, and they know what to do, they expect, and since there are now the changes, like they have like a in bubble. Instead of living in the bubble, they're not much sustainable. And this is a large segment, so therefore they are not, could be really counted as a kind of really agent of changes. And uh, within this civil society, so there's some interesting fight. Political, all the kind of things. So uh, uh, my guess would be, as the main challenge, 
the civil society is still there. Even so, it's disintegrating, the core is still there. Uh, even if it's not 15 persons, I don't know, it's probably 10 or whatever, but there is still a place, a space, at least for one or two new parties and new leaders. Mm -hmm. So the basic challenge on Ukraine nowadays is that this society has a tremendous social energy, but this energy is horizontal. You could not transform this energy in political, political projects because political projects are vertical, so to say like uh, parties, like uh, votes, and you know this for statistic that young people in Ukraine, they don't really like vote, so to say, in, the, in terms. And this is, I believe, the largest challenge, the biggest challenge in Ukraine. If you want to change the, this political landscape in Ukraine, you have to deal specifically with this group, which is very much there, which is very much young, educated, living in the large cities, but as I put it, it's a, it's a beautiful generation. It's very vociferous, but basically it's very much important. important. So something has to be done to work in this direction. Thank you. Um, and uh, I will apologize in advance because Yaroslav has a flight to catch tonight, so he may have to leave the panel slightly early. If I, what was your name? We have hour yet. <laughs> if I may actually ask a follow-up real briefly about generations in Ukraine, would you say that there is a, a generation conflict um, and uh, or, or has actually the situation in Ukraine united? Uh, I wouldn't say term conflict. I would say gap. There are some of gap, because in terms of that, but I'm, I'm basically, basically in the value studies. Uh, so uh, younger generation, younger Ukrainians, they have a much more in the values in terms of the peer group in the West than with ours older Ukrainians. But still, it's just potential. The clear question: what you could, what you should do, or what you could do with this. Thank you very much. Uh, at this stage, would you like to be included or shall I enliven the discussion with questions? Frankly, I'm most interested in comparing the situation. Uh, Ms. Bogumiła Berdychowska surprised me with a pessimistic view of the situation after the 2014 revolution. However, I do think that in this project especially and always, we should compare the change to this, the change that had happened after 2004 and that could perhaps help us get the right level of, of balance between pessimism and optimism. I think that's an erroneous uh, uh, point, thought, because we've already spent four years, four years after the Orange Revolution, nobody in Ukraine doubted that there were great, great hopes uh, that it had all been wasted by politicians. So, hence, if you are willing to be comparing the sentiments, then you should either uh, compare the sentiments the day after the Orange Revolution and Maidan, and then a different picture emerges of the society. Not to mention the fact that, let me, let me say again, that after Maidan, uh, in the first weeks of the war, Ukrainian nation gave more to the country than they had. It is on their backs that they carried the state. Uh, I can see that you agree and you would like to follow up. Carmen, very briefly, uh, you also have a bigger picture of the reforms. You were the leader of the EU mission uh, that coordinated the aid after <coughs> 2014, but earlier also involved as an expert, uh, not just in Ukraine, but in other states as well. Also, I am a sociologist. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, this is a one of the most fantastic conferences I have participated. So congratulations to, to Pavel. And, uh, and of course, it also shows an incredible depth of Polish expertise on Ukraine, which I can only be very envious of, because I remember in my time, we Hungarians were so much better experts on Eastern Europe than, than you Poles. And over time, it has dramatically changed. I, 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 I'm trying to, uh, to to make a sense of two fantastic sociologists' uh, uh, picture, because I think both of you have uh, had uh, relevant things to, to say. Um, Ukraine is a place of a fantastic discrepancy between society and uh, uh, to saying elite in uh, quotation marks, because uh, this oligarchic elite is, is a very, um, to call it elite is a very misnomer. And uh, <coughs> certainly the first uh, uh, revolution was uh, uh, wasted, 
as you said. Uh, uh, the second, hopefully only partially raised it, but it's still an open question. Um, the, um, you know, I would like to link this conversation to the one uh, previous one, which was also extremely exciting, and uh, Glenn Grant's uh, paper also, uh, uh, a very sobering paper, also pointing in the same, uh, same direction. So essentially, in spite of the, the Maidan revolution, this endemic corruption-based oligarchic system has changed little. Little it has changed. The banks are better. Naftohaz is not a source of extraordinary embezzlement, but, uh, but, but, but the logic of the system hasn't yet changed. And therefore, I can only uh, uh, echo Yaroslav's uh, uh, quest for a new party, an effective new party, who can really a modernist, uh, uh, can be really a, a modernist party. So I think both of you are right. Uh, this five million uh, strikes me because if 60% of that is in Poland, it means three million. In my, it's really extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> it would be very good to reconcile whether, uh, how much of it is the, uh, you know, like you said, uh, forced uh, to emigration and how much of it is uh, modern people. Probably there are both. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and other than that, it's really the big question for me is how to generate the kind of modernization reforms that uh, Ukraine needs. And I am really extremely skeptical about those checklist uh, evaluations of reform, that they have a long uh, checklist where, let's say, uh, small insignificant reforms equal to, uh, to independence of the judiciary. Uh, so, so what we need is really a critical, a smart evaluation of what generates the kind of change that takes Ukraine away from this patronal politics, patronal state into uh, a modern uh, rule of law system. So that is really for me the, uh, uh, the, the big question listening to you as well as listening, of course, uh, uh, this critical conversation from, uh, from the military because, and th that would be the, the last word in this uh, contribution of mine, it, reform is the number one national security issue, including, and first of all, of the army. And I am very frustrated. Well, and this, uh, it goes back to this uh, topic of disappointment, disillusionment, which was brought up also in the last panel as well when we talked about reforms. Uh, um, yeah, we have to find a way to get yeah, these yeah. reforms. I want to ask Natalia real briefly because uh, Yaroslav brought up this uh, idea of the disintegration of civil society uh, four years after the Maidan. And I want to ask if you agree with this, and does it have to do maybe with the fact that uh, the civil society has been playing a huge role filling in the gap where the state has not uh, been able to fill in, and is this just a, because of a lot of fatigue? Well, I basically agree with it. Uh, there is my presentation there, a poster about the volunteer networks uh, and the structural problems, and it basically says about the lack of t uh, that our volunteer networks and most of NGOs are mostly ego networks. That's a term uh, from a social network analysis, but it m mostly means that there is some leader and hierarchy built up around this leader and lack of normal conversations uh, um, uh, across the, uh, well, second or third levels. Uh, there is no, co uh, no coordination. And those egos, uh, those ego networks, they are building up this uh, civil society, builds up like a communist party. They are just reproducing the same uh, structures. Uh, that is, I think that's uh, somehow natural because there's so no other um, examples. Uh, well, in the uh, book which has been prepared, there will be uh, our, Article with Vitalik, where is Vitalik? This 
uh, 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 young veteran of war uh, who is probably, uh, well, okay. Uh, and it, it's called Revolutionary Road of Ukraine from descent to the uh, common sense of modern society, the modern Ukrainian society. And we describe all those problems uh, uh, Yaroslav was talking about in terms of a system analysis. So I basically agree. Uh, and still 10% is a huge potential. Uh, and there is a, a place for piracy. And, uh, but I think uh, if our international friends and partners want to somehow facilitate <coughs> the political changes or the uh, improving quality of uh, governance uh, in Ukraine, they should be helping um, civil society in a different way. I, pre I represent the civil society organizations that does not enjoy a lot of grants, as you may know. <laughs> I am, we are quite different. And I think that uh, this uh, problem which Yaroslav was talking about is partially enforced by the very poor strategy of international help to the NGOs. I can go a length, but we have no time for it. No, but tell. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, there are lots of grants for civil capacity in, uh, enforcing in, in building a capacity of something like this, but uh, those um, programs do not build organizations. They build projects which are dissolved uh, right after the uh, money uh, ends. And that is a big problem. Uh, and, that, uh, and because of that, uh, and, and there will be no parties. Because uh, parties are um, actually being built from some volunteer organization, from some NGOs, from some big associations, right? And there are no big associations. My organization uh, has 75 members, real members, and it's one of the biggest, you know. But it's, it's very small, in fact. In order for some real new party to emerge, there should be some NGOs or some associations with thousands of real members. Please, Thank I see that uh, Yaroslav uh, wanted to say. Before uh, I give the floor to Professor Hritsak, I would like to include Professor Hnatyuk to our dis discussion. She observes the uh, Ukrainian changes from the Polish perspective, but also looking up close. Uh, at them, and the topic has emerged of a new party. And I remember a year ago, during the first session of this conference, we had the evening panel that I'm sure you all recall. It was very stormy. And uh, we also had the politicians participating who were understood as the creators, the creators to be of that new party. So where are they today? They're not here, but that's not the issue. From your observations, would you say that this is a central problem of the life in Ukraine today? Uh, the way you look at it, is it realistic uh, for the Ukrainian uh, reality to have a party that's completely alternative to the existing system? I'm not convinced that this question should be addressed to me. I'm. Uh, saying it seriously. I don't feel competent. Well, maybe Professor Hritsak then. Well, maybe it's not the right question. Uh, it's not a question of not having such uh, parties. There are such parties, uh, Sila Ludu, uh, People's Power and so on. But they don't have the resources. They don't have any resources to get as far uh, as to enter Parliament. So they just discuss uh, about what to do in order to be elected. And uh, the sign of hope is that this uh, discussion is very strong in the social media especially. So what should be done? They do have uh, uh, the... Uh, intention to continue. So Ukraine is, is not a sprinter's uh, country, but a long-distance uh, runner's country. It runs tire distance. This is tire distance, which means they, have to, they want to run for a long distance, so to say. They basically do understand that probably most likely they won't 
they have no chances or very little chances in the next elections, 2019. But they're thinking already about next elections, 2024, because it's a, it's a strategy. It's a strategy, so that's where right, very, 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 very to go. And uh, uh, the second thing is, and this is reflects to some, ex to some extent, I believe, the, the, the fundamental problem of Ukraine. How, make, how to make this movement sustainable? So what is the lesson so from the Samopom story? Uh, because that seems to be a party that the doctor ordered, and yet it hasn't... Uh, we, we, are, we are going into details. No, but it's an important, it's an important detail. Uh, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's a not a new party. It's a still very much ego party, not oligarch, but some kind of like an oligarch. But what they do, they are smart, especially so very smart. They know how to fake. They know how to fake and do it very efficiently, and I support it because you have to fake it until you make it, so to say. <laughs> and this is what they do. And at least they have some coverage throughout Ukraine. But maybe the solution is uh, in self governance. Uh, we've witnessed at the uh, Polish Ukrainian Forum in Rzeszów recently. Uh, to what extent uh, local government reform has succeeded. Uh, Irena uh, Vereszczuk is with us, uh, who was active in uh, local um, authorities, has experience. So maybe uh, this uh, self local self-government uh, movement is the place where a new Ukrainian society is formed. Well, uh, decentralizing reform is uh, one of the few that have succeeded. Uh, so that's at the level of uh, municipal, local authorities. And it's not the reform that the EU is currently concerned about, but the fact that local communities uh, learn to be accountable for their activities and that they fight corruption locally, that people organize themselves independently and the gov government is withdrawing uh, from uh, Kiev's uh, perspective and beginning uh, dialogue with uh, local uh, authorities. So uh, it's not to say that uh, this will lead to emergence uh, of new political parties, but at this level people are able to unite. Uh, local elections demonstrate that uh, city mayors, uh, heads of uh, communities, are people who are devoted, and this is a very positive change. I believe that the strength of uh, local authorities uh, may save Ukraine. But uh, I'm not uh, prepared to respond to the question raised, but I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, uh, the general lieutenant uh, said that he knew how uh, to uh, recover Donbass and reintegrate it with Ukraine. And he claimed it would be by military operation. Uh, so given that, uh, what strategy should Ukraine adopt to uh, recover Crimea and Donbass? Uh, all this uh, NATO and EU orientation, but what will be the strategy to recover and reintegrate Donbass and to achieve consensus in uh, Ukrainian society? And what price are we ready to pay for that? If uh, society will uh, participate in this, we need to take this into account. If this will be a Croat uh, scenario, uh, with a military operation, there will be a different price 
and then if we implement uh, the Minsk agreement, then we ha will have a frozen conflict like in Moldova. And that's what we should discuss, so what strategy to choose and how to arrive at uh, national consensus. And that's where we need your support uh, in al analytical work and your substantive support. That's what we need. And decentralization and local authorities, we can cope with uh, alone. And, and if we even touch this topic of reintegration, looking at um, how communities work together, maybe we could bring in the religious aspect. Mikhailo, if you could talk a little bit about how uh, the religious aspect is in terms of providing humanitarian assistance um, and also how the society has changed in terms of its attitude towards religion as a result of, uh, of the, the, the protest but also the war. Well, we have volunteers and the army. We observe uh, ambitious change in uh, reintroducing religion to the public sphere. So the churches uh, may also seek uh, popular trust popular confidence, uh, but we observe that civil society seems to be ahead of the church. So this competition is favorable both for the church and for society, so we should work together. But this sociology is a sociology of the minority. The Maidan revolution was a revolution of the minority, and uh, the separatists uh, and in the East were also a minority movement. So uh, we need to look to the future around uh, values and consensus on values to be proposed also to the minorities. And that's uh, the way the churches should work. And a few words on Donbass. Before uh, the start of Maidan, I was... Uh, heading um, uh, the uh, Christian University in Donbass. So we are after not only quantitative, but also after quality change of our um, society. People have their political views, their local culture. They have moved, they have uh, changed the domicile. And uh, these people have uh, connected, have joined uh, integrated with Ukraine, but we have huge disproportions in demographic uh, structures in, on the occupied territories because Ukrainians have left these territories and went to other parts of Ukraine. So it's a matter of social structure and of culture. When our Christian university worked in Donetsk, we planted um, 80 trees to leave something behind us. But my, my kids ask me now, we, for whom have we left these trees over there? And at the school where my daughters uh, were mm, uh, learning, uh, people are being uh, tortured and uh, our uh, library, which was uh, the best um, in the area of theological literature, has been destroyed. So uh, such questions arise. And uh, religious communities, they should uh, propose an inclusive model for society, a moral um, model because on the occupied territories uh, religious, uh, religion is monopolized by the Russian Orthodox Church and all uh, religious minorities are persecuted. Uh, Protestants, uh, Kiev Orthodox Church members or the Greek Catholics, they are all persecuted. So there is a re religious war over there. And we should consider how to develop a model and an inclusive uh, picture of the future on which churches should also work. 
so that the church uh, could propose uh, an attractive model for society, and, uh, and I believe that this will be done in Ukraine. Funny, Professor, back in the discussion, because I want to ask, one of the senses I kind of get here is that it seems that Ukraine, for obvious reasons, but also um, slightly not, is that it's left uh, largely on its own to try to fix all these problems that it's trying to deal with. Uh, so maybe ask, is this, has this have an effect on how does the society, Ukrainian society feel? Do, with more and more of kind of the international attention being taken away from Ukraine, um, especially over the last year or so, um, is there a sense of abandonment in Ukraine? Uh, abandonment? Um, and at what point does this uh, become, uh, does it, does it lead to apathy <coughs> in the society, uh, apathy mm -hmm. and uh, feelings, of, feelings of not being supported by the international community? Thank you very much for this question. I wouldn't uh, say that it is that important, uh, the feeling of being uh, left alone or of being uh, abandoned. Uh, the key word here is uh, uh, the feeling that there is no prospect for the future. And uh, the key here is uh, the perception by youth, by the young generation. I have uh, the impression that uh, the Ukrainian state, the government, is doing very little to attract young people. And it's a pity that politicians are not with us here, right now. There is something absolutely uh, irrational due to to this uh, tact, uh, electoral tactics of the four-year terms, we are losing the future. I am terrified by the blindness of politicians who, in the name of gaining or not losing the electorate, voters who are dependent on all kinds of privilege, especially incredibly uh, elaborate system of uh, privileges for pensioners and I say this with full awareness because I will retire in three years time I believe we need to give way to young people creating prospects for them in order for them to realize their own ideas. Yet, in the name of privilege for people who are anyway more or less have arranged their lives, uh, we deprive uh, the young people of uh, prospects and then we are surprised that they emigrate to study abroad to Poland or even further away, and uh, yet there are increasingly interesting and attractive programs, including Erasmus Plus, Plus, and of course not all of them leave, but without prospects uh, for the future for youth, for the young generation, those who are uh, approaching the end of uh, secondary school, so over 16 and uh, after studies over 30s, they don't find a uh, positive uh, prospect for themselves in the country and they lose uh, energy and faith and they decide that maybe it's better and easier to live. One has only one life somewhere where uh, prospects will be somewhat better than at home where uh, 
on a personal level they don't have prospects or they don't see them and they don't perceive uh, prospects for change be it a reform or be it just local change I see that you are getting ready to leave uh, but please before there's a very interesting point that was put forward and let me put that on the table perhaps uh, professor will uh, take up this link to the youth uh, to what extent have the recent developments uh, since 2014 uh, sped up the creation of middle class in ukraine to what extent do you think what happened at the time has sped up the creation of the middle class because looking at it from the historical point of view this is one of the key questions about the condition of democracy about changes in every uh, western uh, nation this is a fundamental issue is there more of a middle class is it stronger has it felt its identity it's a very complex question because it very much depends on who's asking and what the context is what i understand and what I'm observing is that uh, the Ukrainian middle class is not, does not identify itself with status but standard of life. They could be relatively poor, but they can still consider themselves middle class, and that's an interesting phenomenon that what happened over the last decade. To what extent has the revolution made uh, an impact? I think that strongly, but it's not a constant dynamic. It is variable. There is also something which is called the fatigue of the society. And I think that this class is revolutionary, but only to, uh, to a certain extent, which means that as far as mass protest goes, then yes, but in truth, if that nationalist part did not exist in Maidan, I doubt that it would have won. This is what the occupier behaves like. The best they can do is uh, volunteering, etc. But then again, they are very focused as far as security is concerned and identity in 14. The security issue was a very powerful one, and that's why the society was as focused as it is. Right now, the level uh, of this security feeling is, is lower. That's why we feel the disintegration that was earlier mentioned. So it's very difficult to say, but generally the question remains whether at least some decent political project will emerge out of this society because it has no voice. It exists, but it has no voice. So who will articulate that voice? That's the question. Thank you very much. I, I need to leave. Thank you. Have a safe trip back. Uh, maybe we could also include uh, uh, Professor uh, Rushenko uh, into this discussion which about uh, the middle class. Um, Yes, I wanted to say something different, but okay, let me intervene in uh, in that discourse. The point of view that uh, I uh, s heard today very much depends on your location, whether you're in Warsaw, Lviv, Kiev, or Kharkiv. Kharkiv is 30 kilometers from the Russian border, 15 minutes of flight of uh, combat helicopter. In uh, 2014, I was a participant of a dramatic study uh, using the sociological methods. We posed a question, what has changed since the war? So let me respond very briefly. Uh, uh, there was a breakdown of civilization I saw that in many representations, many signs, not just the symbols and the slogans, but also the anthropology, various, various people, various systems of work. 
sociological and cultural changes, as well as uh, church uh, religious issues. The Russian uh, Orthodox Church was uh, a tool of influence, and it has been so since uh, Chinggis Khan, and uh, there has never been a, a different pathway leading this person to a diff this country to a different trajectory. My concept is being criticized from both uh, sides, uh, both by uh, my colleagues, my Polish colleagues who discussed that with me said that there is no such Russian civilization, that it's not a civilization at all. My colleagues from the east of Ukraine uh, find this issue very painful because they grew up convinced that it was a single nation, a single civilization. They had f a lot of contacts with Russia. They went to conferences, they discussed with them. And right now it turns out that we differ, that these are two different worlds. Uh, today we discussed what the better format would have been, the Geneva or the Normandy format. Neither of them is functional and it's not going to be functional. If you want to find the answer, uh, read wealth. Or Martians landed on the Earth, and nobody can speak to anybody because they do not understand the Earth, uh, earthly symbols. So he, there should be common values um, around the round table that would allow the parties to communicate with one another, a, a, a similar view of uh, accountability and dignity. And if that doesn't exist, and if it and it doesn't, then what I want to say is that for Ukrainians, for those that are the Easterners, uh, as viewed from the West, this disintegration of civilization, this pathway to Europe is a very positive thing. It is viewed in various aspects. It's a process that is a very long-lasting one, and it's precipitating. Up to 2014, uh, there were theoretical discussions concerning this uh, line of disintegration, and it was a virtual one. Uh, at some point in Western Ukraine, uh, the 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 where Greek Catholicism meets Orthodox ch Church, but it's uh, wrong. It's not true. So I don't. I won't talk about why. Currently, this disintegration line is a physical one, uh, but uh, the uh, problem has not been removed because this discourse is still operational inside Ukraine. Our enemies have hidden away. You will not be able to see anyone with the uh, three colored ribbons. Uh, nobody will uh, say that uh, straight in a straightforward manner, but they have an electoral, electoral base uh, close to 10-15%. What's important in the Russian Federation, there are 10 to 15 people who are pro-European, and it's the contrary in our country. So, uh, it is along that line that the disintegration took place. For us, it's a positive phenomenon because we, on that we should build our new European identity. It's weak, it has always been weak, especially in the east of Ukraine. And this is an ideological aspect and a military one. Being familiar with your opponent, you can predict uh, its subsequent steps. And uh, I uh, am an expert at that. I have published a book about the Russian-Ukrainian uh, hybrid war, and I want to complete my second book very soon, The War of Civilizations. I noticed that the tactics of Moscow has not changed for centuries. And we can very easily predict uh, what is going to happen in 10, 15 years, as long as Russia exists in the format that we see today. Now, as regards the middle class, uh, I think the, these issues are of secondary importance. A war is going on, and until that war is completed, all those other issues are of secondary importance, especially when you live close to the border. And uh, as you will know, in 2013, I saw people suffer, especially those that were pro-Ukrainian. And uh, one of my friends uh, lost 10 kilograms. He lost a lot of weight. And another one uh, 
became ill. Um, he had a mental illness. Uh, they woke up at night and they heard the roar of engines. Uh, the general uh, went on air uh, and announced that the Russians were going to uh, invade Ukraine. He was in Kiev at the time and he said that it was the Russian tactics to explode bridges. He was in Kiev and we were in Kharkiv, close to the border, and we did not want to be occupied. So here is what the situation that we view today. Uh, we're talking about the religious uh, factor. It's not just a question of sociology. It's also an issue of survival. Religion currently for Ukraine is important. We see how uh, from both sides there are varying religious motivations. Uh, the, the notion of dignity is a, a, a religious concept. Uh, There is a, a an orthodox context to these values, uh, but we have a different one, and those two oftentimes cannot be combined. And can all the uh, orthodox churches be integrated? Moscow is happy when they see disintegration between the various the various religions. We should uh, um, propose put forward an inclusive model, and the church could be a very important element. Uh, in Lugansk and Donetsk districts, we conducted studies uh, and we came to the conclusion that the conflict has no ethnical grounds. It is not a conflict, an ethnic conflict. Uh, both Russians and Ukrainians said so. But, uh, of course, when we put forward a question about the future of Ukraine, whether it belongs to the European Union or another association, then uh, what is said is the following. In our territory, uh, ethnic Ukrainians and Russians and other nations that live in our territory and on their side, ethnic Russians, Ukrainians and, and many other nations, as was often the case, uh, Caucasians. So, Borea, I often say that when order came to for the first time in 1239, the, uh, uh, the physiognomy, the external appearance of these people was... Uh, uh, to, let's go back. Uh, let me give the floor to Daniel Szeligowski, who is one of the Polish experts researching the um, Ukrainian issue from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. I'm sorry. I will try to uh, respond uh, to many of the themes uh, which were raised here, uh, and I'll try to be controversial. The middle class. I disagree that there is no middle class because of the war. Sorry, we can't hear uh, the comments on the side. So I wanted to say that uh, the middle class uh, didn't uh, grow because of lack of uh, support uh, from government. 
as there is no reform of the judiciary and of uh, ownership rights, property rights. Uh, the middle class uh, enhances stability. Uh, public opinion polls uh, show that uh, there is uh, no support for the government, uh, current government. So this government doesn't assure stability and yet it will be regarded in history as uh, a, a very reformist one. Both the cabinet of Mr. Yatsenyuk and the current one will be presented as the most reformist uh, governing group in history. At least uh, it is uh, seen like this today. But unfortunately, expectations uh, grow. And that's why I believe uh, no new party will emerge in Ukraine. And if it does, it will be similar to those existing, a one based on strong leadership. Looking at uh, opinion polls, uh, the first uh, issue is to resolve the, the war problem, the social issues and corruption. Uh, so for a new party to have a chance, it has to promise impossible things in order um, for politicians to be so they will claim that uh, they will increase wages uh, tenfold and uh, such uh, things uh, in order to gain support. So this leads me to indicate some five phenomena or trends which may not be the most important ones but I believe them to be important after Maidan but they are keep uh, changing. The increase of uh, national awareness, uh, people identifying with Ukraine and being proud of being Ukrainian, that's a change, and readiness to defend Ukraine with uh, armed forces, with arms in hand. And uh, a revaluation of uh, attitudes uh, to the external world. So less sympathy to Russia, more sympathy to uh, NATO and the EU, and a change in attitudes towards uh, the Polish people. It's in 1914 that, uh, since 1914, that uh, Ukraine. Uh, increases in sympathy to Poland. But recently it's again declining. So the sympathy for Poles is recently declining, but uh, we are still the most uh, liked nation uh, among its uh, neighbors. Uh, the third uh, trend that's uh, empowerment of society. On the one hand, society is replacing government. I've worked in Rzeszów and my colleagues were buying bulletproof vests in Poland and then took them over to Ukraine and to Donbass. So that's a plus, but there is a negative aspect that in the increase of pressure of society on government leads to decisions being made in the streets rather than in uh, government cabinets. And uh, the revaluation of attitudes towards uh, the application of uh, arms and um, violence. So we are facing issues as uh, after uh, the war the government has lost monopoly over uh, the use of force. Uh, so society has taken over a bit. And uh, another aspect, uh, the decline of uh, confidence in uh, state structures, uh, both government, um, judiciary, banking system and so on. So only the church uh, the uh, army and uh, the um, voluntary organizations enjoy uh, confidence. Well, uh, and the impoverishment of the population. Uh, 
uh, at the for forum uh, Poland Ukraine uh, in Rzeszów, uh, the former president of uh, Georgia said that uh, trade. Uh, uh, the former pr uh, prime minister of Armenia said that uh, there was a drop of turnover in trade. But uh, Ukraine was uh, going into crisis already before the Russian war. So the irascible, irresponsible policy of Yanukovych uh, and uh, the exchange rate applied already before uh, the war, the uh, country was going uh, financially bankrupt. Well, we are coming to a close uh, of uh, the evening session. We will have translation for only 10 minutes more. Uh, simply, uh, interpreters uh, have their limits. So there is a point where we either must stop or can continue without uh, translation. Uh, but I do hope that uh, if you would like uh, from the floor uh, to intervene, uh, you are welcome. Still have interpretation, so, uh, so I'll try in Ukrainian. Uh, well, we've heard a lot about corruption. And uh, uh, Mrs. Berdychowska has rightly said that we shouldn't only take 2014 and the benchmark for comparisons, because corruption has been uh, overwhelming at the time and we couldn't talk about it. And the same was in 2004. And we say that four years ago it was impossible to imagine but looking at uh, the situation today and uh, the fight against corruption, I uh, have the impression that they are fighting the effects and not the uh, causes of corruption, that they are just pretending, uh, just making a show of uh, the issue of corruption. And yet it's not a matter of uh, forming institutions, but eliminate, uh, defining and eliminating the causes of corruption. So we should talk of corruption, pointing at other issues uh, in order to seek uh, to resolve them. No. Ukraine's been disillusioned, and I wanted to comment about this quickly. Um, I think today's Ukraine leaders and Ukraine public feel a lot better than they did in 2014, 2015. And the irony, and many people here will be surprised me saying this, is that Trump is better than Obama for Ukraine. Um, this is the irony, biggest irony. Um, Obama, if you're talking about who's pro-Russian, Obama was more pro-Russian than Trump on Ukraine. Um, and in Obama's entire first term in office was pro-Russian. I mean, you know, I mean, I won't go into it, it's too much detail, but so that. So in that sense, uh, today, because of Russian actions which have enraged America, I mean, the anti-Russian mood in Washington is, is as much as it was 30 years ago now, it's 1980s level. Um, so in that sense, thank you, Putin, and thank you, the situation has changed. So uh, I think you, the Ukraine leadership feels a lot better today than it did. 2014, 2015, Poroshenko, Second comment. Uh, okay, quickly. Second, Quick. My second comment is about um, going back to really Andrei Kahut as well, what he was saying about reforms. I think it's uh, too pessimistic to say nothing's been done and, and the glass is either, either empty or full. The glass is half full, both half full and half empty. And um, there have been many things that have happened in Ukraine. This has been the biggest period of reform in Ukraine for the last ever time since 1991. And many of those, we've heard about decentralization. Um, nobody's mentioned gender question in Ukraine. The gender question is now mainstream. It was marginalized before 2014. Um, and, and on corruption, yes. the two biggest areas um, I would like to answer about corruption, yes, there's a lot more to be done. You promised yes, quick. Yes, I'm going to answer quick. this quick. And you'll enjoy this one. 
If we want to stop corruption in Ukraine, there are two things we need to do. Clean the swamp in Washington, London, and Brussels, and then we'll clean corruption. In Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks a lot. And All last, right. que uh, last can, comment? No, can... Oh, oh. <laughs> Maybe you. Okay. <laughs> um, we've heard a lot today about the role of um, civil society in Maidan. We've heard a lot about the role of civil society in supporting the army in um, defending Ukraine. Um, I'd like to ask if anyone could comment on the role of civil society in ending the conflict in Ukraine in peace building. Thank you. And last, okay. Olga and uh, Dan, and this one. Uh, no, no more, no more. All right. Okay, so <laughs> more, uh, more, I'm, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to just uh, ask you this. I, I was, I'm over and over, every single conference I go to on Ukraine, and, and I, first of all, Yaroslav, excellent stuff, too bad he's gone. But every single conference we say this, we have this rhetoric. And I just want to, to the first presentation, I really, we can say the exact same thing about Poland. Mass emigration to the country I live in, the United Kingdom, which has caused trouble here. Uh, a, a political class, no offense, Pavel, but a political class that is a little bit sketchy, to say the least. And finally, and finally, the rise of nationalism and, and or national patriotism, as it was mentioned. I think sometimes we need to think, what are we comparing Ukraine against? And what do we mean when we're making these statements? And how bad is Ukraine? It's bad, but is it as bad as we say? Thank you. And next one, uh, Ambassador Fritz. three brief comments and I promise to be brief. <laughs> um, one, the problem in Ukraine is not um, nationalism, it's a lack of patriotism and those are two very different things. And I think this is known and one of the most hopeful things I've heard this evening is the slow, deep rise of, of patriotism and not in a nationalist form. I think that's the good news. The bad news is the corruption. But my, my second comment is on Obama versus Trump. First, don't obsess about Washington and don't oversimplify. Obama, I lived through this. Obama's learning curve on Russia was very much the same as George W. Bush's. They both started out with great hopes. They both learned the hard way. But when it came to a test, they did, they, these were honest failures, by which I mean they didn't sell out Ukraine or Poland they simply, they learned. Where Trump is more complicated because there is a big question mark over him, but the administration is, is pretty determined within certain limits, and the mood in Washington is indeed, it's like the 1980s, absolutely right. Final comment, the, I don't know what you meant by draining the swamp. However, if, you, if we want to get at, if we want to put pressure on Putin, we need to think about asymmetric escalation, especially for the um, nerve gas attack in London. Um, personally, I would go after his entourage, go after the money. Um, that's asymmetric. I do it, I would do it hard. Um, the, I, Right, and this is a fantastic conference because of the degree of sophistication in the room about what's really happening in Ukraine. I don't know how I can possibly sub... I don't know how to summarize it. The level of expertise in America is not such great as in, as in Warsaw, so congratulations on that. Thank you, Ambassador. Andre. Ja chciałem odnieść się do kwestii porównania. I will not make that comment, but I do have another comment actually. Uh, in 1974 started whatever Huntington called the third wave of democratization. And there is a huge body of transitional literature. And in the 80s, Latin American countries joined this transition. And Latin American scholars who studied transitions came up with this concept, the relative deprivation hypothesis. So we are talking about fatigue, we are talking about frustration, disillusionment, and so on. But it's not new. There is nothing new. Every, basically, every country that goes through democratic transition faces this relative deprivation <coughs> hypothesis. So my question is to those people who talk about frustration, 
How different Ukraine is from Latin American countries? Is it a new pattern of development or this is something that we experienced in the past in different countries? Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes the series of questions. So, uh, in the interpreters, uh, if the interpreters are willing to continue for two minutes, then we can continue for another few minutes. But tomorrow is another day. Oh, so we will have a whole day against us, uh, uh, together with us. We have a video at ten. That either you can issue very briefly uh, to give the floor to Lidmila towards the end. Uh, uh, the latest piece of uh, Taras. So I think I I understand the swamp uh, analogy. I don't think we do good to, to Ukraine, and that is also to the lady, that we always defend the leadership. Uh, and you don't do it, uh, Taras, so I'm not, uh, not addressing, but what I am addressing it to you and to many uh, 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 people of Ukrainian uh, background in, in the United States and Canada. The, we have good examples both of comprehensive reforms, such as Poland after 1989, we also have post-Soviet states with very good uh, reforms from which we can learn, such as Georgia in 2004 and onward. So the Ukrainian performance, we have to say, is really not meeting uh, expectations born out of, 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 of comp uh, comparison. So, so we do need to think very hard uh, in the current political situation where Poroshenko is preparing for uh, elections and he is not going to, uh, to risk uh, things like independence, judiciary. We also have to think very hard what are the feasible reforms, but we shouldn't be too protective of a very disappointing uh, uh, reform performance. And again, I want also to link it to the previous uh, uh, panel that even in the most vital national uh, security issues, uh, Thank it you. has been uh, uh, below expectation. Thank you so much. Natalia? Uh, I will be very brief. I want to uh, create a cognitive dissonance and say something positive, right? Okay? Something optimistic. Uh, because I think that uh, the main uh, change which occurred as a result of three revolutions and the war is uh, the uh, change in the attitude of Ukrainian people to violence. Violence was normal in the USSR. It is normal in Russia, in modern Russia. It's the only way of conflict transformation. It, the, it's normal to accept violence from the state actors and non-state actors. And now even those national Druzhiny, even the per perceived uh, possibility of uh, that they may use violence creates a huge debate in the Ukrainian society. So uh, this uh, civilizational divide uh, lies uh, in our attitude to, to violence. It is, uh, it, it is a huge change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And very short, really short. Bardzo krótkie, pewnie. Dzisiaj rano ksiądz arcybiskup bardzo ważną... Well, today in the morning the Archbishop uh, said a very important thing that uh, preventing corruption is up to every one of us at home. And uh, opinion polls show that the main obstacle is uh, the tendency to solve uh, problems by means of corruption and gender macroeconomic stability has been assured by two women, uh, the head of the Central Bank and the Minister of Finance. So we just have a minute to summarize. We're just uh, talking about Muslims. In the Crimea, when Christians uh, were celebrating uh, the holidays, the uh, religious feasts, they had no uh, prayer houses, so they were allowed by Muslims uh, to use their mosques. 
if we could develop this approach, this would uh, radically change our nation and our community. Well, positive thinking, and I am convinced that what over the past 13 years I've observed in Ukraine, that's how long I've been living in Kiev, this is a very profound change in attitudes towards others. Such a level of tolerance, comparing the time since I've been in Ukraine for the first time with the situation today, it's uh, just uh, a huge difference. Ethnical nationalism is absent. Uh, it is uh, simply inappropriate uh, to uh, talk in such terms. It is simply forbidden, outright inappropriate and forbidden. So it's incredible how attitudes have changed, how much more empathy one encounters, and much greater interest in the outside world. Uh, maybe the level of uh, analysis, the level of perception is perhaps not of extremely high quality, but information is present and not necessarily via Moscow. And this is a fundamental change from my point of view. The, uh, and uh, so this uh, change over from ethnical thinking and interest not only in your own garden but also in the external world. Well, it's very late, so just let's uh, not summarize. The situation is changing dynamically, and I can just say that I wonder how this story will go on and what will be the outcome of this struggle with the oligarchic system. Because uh, this nation, this society, these people have proven that they deserve a better fate. At 21.45 there is a transport provided and tomorrow we <coughs> start at 10, you are invited until even evening, and I uh, really encourage you to come.